Justice is everybody's right and everybody's fight. We can never forget that because that's, that's what animated it for me. To recognize and honor the fabulous, the magnificent Dr. Cecil Canton. I've been around through a lot of iterations of leadership. And I remember when Cecil came on the scene and we had just gone through what I like to call uh, uh, one of CFA's leadership revolutions. Like there was a huge turnover in leadership and the organization did a giant shift from service organizing to labor organizing, the actual mm -hmm. idea of organizing as a labor union. And so when Cecil came on to be the then chair of the Council for Affirmative Action, I was like, who is this dude? <laughs> you know, and I said, and I, but I was happy about him because I could feel his black earthiness. Ooh. I understood him. I could relate to him. Uh, he would walk around the room. Now, I, everybody who knows this, please, you know, just laugh because, you know, Cecil can't come in the room and just go sit down. <laughs> Cecil got to walk around. He got to talk to everybody. He got to touch everybody. He got to make sure he said something. You said, oh, you know, so-and-so just said, so now you got to walk you over to this person. You got to have that conversation with him. And he was a welcome breath of fresh air in this organization. Much needed. As I said, when I started, I used to tease and say that it was me and the Cottonheads. Because mm. uh, it was me and the sea of, of, of white folks with white hair. Not that that's a bad thing. It's just there was no, there was no one looking like me there. And so I remember Cecil would say, we're going to change this, right? And I was like, yeah, yeah, okay. Because as staff, I had been asked by one of our previous general managers to do outreach to black faculty. And I was like, and bring them into what? <laughs> <laughs> no, I said that. I said, bring them into what? I'm not going to yeah, do that. that. I'm going to put myself out there for, mm -hmm. for what? Because I had watched some of our leaders organize to push out mm -hmm some of the folks who were leading the, the racial justice work or attempting to lead the racial justice work. Like, I'm not bringing them, I'm not doing that. But no, Cecil has an amazing ability to persist and insist even when people are not welcoming him. Mm -hmm. Even when people are resisting the vision. You know, because he always says to me, write your plan and work your plan, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And everybody ain't got to be in on that, but you are, mm -hmm. right? And here we are today, and we look around this organization. I had, I mean, who could have ever imagined that CFA organizationally would be where it is today? Mm -hmm. That we would be standing up in the ways that we are under the banner of anti-racism and social justice and anti-blackness. Mm -hmm. Anti-blackness. When Cecil would even would encounter so much of that trying to do the work. Mm -hmm. I have my own share of storage, which I won't share with you. People say do it, do it, do it. amazing things, and you go, what? What did you just say? What did you just do? But he persisted and insisted, and he told us to be faithful that those folks would go and new people would come. Mm -hmm. And just think about how true that is. Look at MBA over there. Mm. That's my girl. <laughs> that's, that's, Mar Margarita is always someone I want riding with me on my side. You know, Sharon. I met Sharon a long time ago, Sharon. and and Sharon was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a member of the union, but I don't want to be bothered with CFA. <laughs> right? Look at her now. Ow. Bothering CFA. <laughs> <laughs> CISO has done tremendous work in this organization to pave the way, and this is a person who's retired mm -hmm. and still, still impacting still. us, mm -hmm. still impacting us, still mentoring us, still calling people, still being available to do the work That's of right. CFA. Because you know, you know, That's we, right. you say that thing that once you're CFA, you never leave. That's right. But we don't even have to tell him that. He comes, which is a wonderful thing. But that is also a mark of what it means when we talk about people being leaders, mm. when we talk about people being visionary. And those, my friends, are the more the kinds of people I want us to work really hard to get on our chapters. Not just placeholders, but mm -hmm. people who can help us to take our vision 
and where we are now. Am I talking too long? No. <laughs> it's not the Grammys. <laughs> but, but people who are able, people who are able to help us to take our vision, to, to create a vision, and to keep moving. Oh, that's me pressing this thing. And, and, and to keep moving as the little engine that can and will and does. Because mm -hmm. that's what CFA is, right? Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so lastly, I just want to... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, so lastly, I just want to share this picture of, of me and Cecil. Mm. This is from 2016. And I think this was an assembly event. And this, I think this was an assembly event and we took a dinner cruise. We were on a oh, dinner cruise. Nice. And I remember I just was feeling so sentimental that day. Oh my God. <laughs> because I, I realized, I said, I don't think, I don't know what's happening. I was like, <laughs> I, was like I, I, think, I was like, I don't think I have ever told Cecil how much he means to me. I'm trying to find Cecil. There he is. <laughs> uh, to share our thoughts with Cecil and about Cecil. And so I'm like, you know, just thinking about it and thinking about it. And I mean, obviously, there's just so much, so much that um, I want to say. But I don't want the mic to go off on me either. <laughs> no one can miss, no one can miss there's a timer. <laughs> there's a timer. <laughs> But anyhow, um, you know, when I started, immediately when I got to Sac State, I joined the union. I mean, that wasn't even a question, right? That wasn't even a question. It was like, I'm joining the union, UFW, this and that. And I'm like, well, I, you know, I don't know. And there's also the Council for Affirmative Action that we're really starting. And we need, we're going to start on our campus now, right? And I'm like, okay, well, what, you know, you want me to be junior faculty rep? We're doing the Council for Affirmative Action at that time. Um, so you're, what do you want me to do? Uh, I'm telling you, you're going to be in this. And I'm, <laughs> and I'm like, I get right to the elevator. You have to visualize it, right? I get to the elevator. I push the button, and he goes, tell me before you get on that elevator what you're going to do. And I said, Okay, I'm in, right? And, you know, he and that's the thing. Like, like Audrey was sharing, persistent, right? Persistent, but because there's a vision. There's a vision as to where we're going. It might not be tomorrow that that vision actualizes itself, but it's, it's foreseeing what's coming and what's needed. And I think for me and my relationship with Cecil and what I have gained and I, what I have gained from you, Cecil, has been that strength that need to pause, to reflect, and to think, where do we go from here? How are we moving forward, right? And not from an individualistic frame, but from a collective frame as far as who's coming with us to do this, right? And who are we bringing in? And who's intentional? Who are we intentionally bringing in so that when we have to transition out for whatever reasons, retirement, what have you, et cetera, that there's people that are continuing that legacy, that are continuing that work, right? And f um, when Cecil retired from Sac State, well, you know, he really didn't retire, right? <laughs> he didn't really retire. But it was when I was starting to transition in my role within our chapter and becoming more involved becoming chapter president, and then eventually getting more involved with CFA statewide. And it was Cecil that always made sure to check in on me. But it wasn't a check-in like, um, <coughs> it wasn't a check-in as far as how CFA going. It was a check-in of how are you doing, the person, right. right, the spirit. Because we know that this work that we're doing anti-racism, social justice, countering um, the day in and days out of white supremacy is taxing every single day. Whether we name it, whether we say it or not, we know our body carries it. And so Cecil has always, you have always, and I don't... Um, 
it doesn't go by me, right? And I don't even know if that's like, if that even makes sense, right? Of what you're doing. Because it's rare on the campus where someone's stopping you and asking you, how are you doing as a person? And I can't tell you the times that you have reached out to me and I don't know if I was, like, sending you energy, right? Because I've been known to, you know, like, <laughs> send energy. And you were like, I got to call Margarita and see how she's doing. But those times that you have called, they have been times when I needed it, right? Or when you would pick up the call that I was making to you when I was crying on the phone and saying, this just happened. You know, I got to put in a cuss word in here at some point. <laughs> at some point, I have to put in a cuss word. I'm feeling like crap, and what do I do? Like, I'm, here's what I'm thinking, and we just walk through it. That is, for me, a sign of an individual that is with me for the long haul. Not just the short term. Not just what are we going to get out of it right now, but for the long haul. There's so much more, like Audrina was saying. I mean, so many stories, so much more that can be said. But I know that I've been blessed. You know, that the has blessed me to have you in my path, right? To have you as not only a, a mentor, but family. Family that I know will be there to tell me um, the truth when I need to hear it, right? to check me when it needs to happen, and to also uplift me when I need that. And I only hope that I can do the same for those that are coming. And I only hope that I can do you justice for those that are coming. I love you. To try to now be fabulous and wonderful, um, <laughs> especially after such great uh, statements from my colleagues and friends. I cannot hear whether this is working or not. I hope it is. It is. Okay. I'm just in a weird spot. Uh, so I had some thoughts about what I wanted to say, and they kind of just went out the window a moment ago, right? <laughs> and part of the reason for that is because it's, it's how do you condense so much to say in such a short period of time? There's nothing I can say that's going to really encapsulate everything I want to say, but I will start with a couple of basic things. I'm not going to promise to try to be short, because every time I try to do that, it turns into me being long-winded, so I apologize <laughs> in advance. My experience in CFA started, uh, you know, this is not even a thing anymore, but many years ago we had a thing called agency fee. And so I thought that it meant that you're automatically in the union, automatically part of the group. And at one point somebody came up to me and said, you know, you should join CFA. I'm like, I already did. Are you sure? Yeah, because they got my money. <laughs> the, the portion of my check that has been deducted happens every month. That means I'm in. <laughs> And then I found out that that's not what it meant at all. Uh, and so then I got approached, and really the person who kind of did the full court press on my campus to get me involved in CFA was Jonathan Carr. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that Jonathan said, probably around 2007, I believe, is the first time I went to an assembly. So Jonathan said, you should come to a CFA assembly. OK, so I go to my first assembly. And I remember my first assembly vaguely, but it was, it's a little bit of a kind of a mash in my head. Because it was so much. There were so many people. It was so new. I'm, quote, just a lecturer. So, you know, as a lecturer, sometimes you get that where, you know, you're not included, you're not invited. We're just glad that you're here doing work that we don't have to do. That's the feeling that you kind of get. So anyway, I'm coming to the, you know, and I remember all the really important people. I remember seeing John Travis at my first CFA assembly. And John Travis, I never got to know him very well because he was on his way out when I was coming in. But, you know, he's this big dude and he's kind of intimidating and there's all the important people walking in groups and I'm seeing all this stuff and I'm like, wow, I, I'm in over my head with all these kind of important people. But there were a few people that spoke to me and started to talk to me, right? One of them was a guy named Mugo Nyaga. I don't know if everybody in here remembers Mugo, but Mugo was so nice to me. He was so sweet to me. He was actually very kind, and he came over very kindly. And then I remember walking somewhere up some hallway. It was probably at the Bonaventure, and then I remember Cecil. How you doing, brother? <laughs> right? And, I, and there's just an energy that comes off of Cecil that is so good and it is so familiar. Um, you know, the way he talks, the way he talks in general, but the way he talks to me sometimes is like talking to my uncle. It's like talking to a member of my family. It's like talking to somebody who not only I can understand, but who can understand me. Just even the hello is like it is from my soul, the center of my soul to the center of yours. I'm acknowledging you. I'm connecting with you. 
And that's what I get from Cecil, and that's what I've always gotten from Cecil, and that's one of the many, many reasons that I love Cecil, and he's just an awesome, amazing person. But there's more reasons than that, because as I started to get more and more involved in CFA, I started to learn more and more things. And I started to get kind of invited into more and more spaces. And I started to get some of the skills that I bring to the table validated a little bit more. I'm good. I'm really good some days. Um, just regular good some days. Um, pretty good some days. I got my all right days, and it's like minimum acceptable days, and it's like <laughs> call Chris tomorrow days, because some days this shit ain't, it, you know. And speaking of cuss words, Margarita, I'm going to really try, but I, it, they just flow like water sometimes. I just looked when Audrina mentioned that picture, that was such a beautiful picture, and I looked in my phone, and I have a few pictures with Cecil, and one of them is a rare picture with me in a suit, because I don't wear suits very often, but I would wear them when we would go to NEA, the, the representative assembly, and we had some times where it was like, the, the focus of our work here shifted for me with some of the work that we did with these other groups of folks. Because it's sometimes when you step out of your own space, it gives you a chance to kind of look back objectively and to look, look back clearly at what you're doing, why you're doing it, and where you're going. Mm -hmm. And that was when I started to really understand the, it's beyond just the little, the, the small things that we tend to think of. So we think, you know, I know Cecil was really instrumental in starting a council for affirmative action. And if you look at it at the surface, that's a nice addition to the union. It's a nice thing. But what I started to realize afterwards is that that was not really what was created. What was created was beyond. Because what was created was the council was a stepping stone and a broader vision that we have to live out and to continue. And I think part of the genius of that is that it changes as we change. It changes as the world changes. It changes as we get going. And so starting to understand that Cecil's role in this organization was not just to do a thing at a time, but it was really a true transformative set of work, right? It was a really transformative set of things. Then through time, I started to understand that there were more things within CFA that looked different when you get closer to those positions of leadership than they did when you're further away. And it was then that I started to understand that what looked like something very welcome and organic in CFA was actually fought through internally. I started to realize that it was not the case that it was just a bunch of yeses, that's a great idea. Wow, that, yes, that's great. Wow, yes, that sounds awesome. Yes, that looks good. Oh, yes, that's wonderful. No, it wasn't that. It was an internal struggle. It's not criticizing anybody or complaining about anybody, but it's a recognition of the depth of the work. My title now is Associate Vice President for the Council for Racial and Social Justice North, and that title, that position exists because of Cecil. Yeah, that's right. It exists because of Cecil's vision. Cecil saw beyond his time in the organization. What I think people might not have realized is Cecil saw and knew this was not going to be a one-person position anymore. It was while he was in it, because he knew he had to nurture that little coal to turn it into the fire it's turned into, otherwise it would have got squashed. And so Cecil did it just with such a, a, an acumen and such a knowledge of what's needed, not for the moment, but what's needed to continue. And that's something that I appreciate greatly, just amazingly from Cecil. The other thing is, is that I love having conversations with Cecil. And early on in my time in CFA, there was a group of folks that I really liked a lot. I mean, I like everybody for different reasons. But I really liked a lot of the Sac State folks, right, because sometimes it was Cecil, Jose Cintron, and there would be no topic of conversation, but within about a half a second, we're laughing our asses off because it's just <laughs> fun and funny and just, you know, witty kind of back and forth banter. And so that sometimes is like, that's what brings joy to life, right? right? It's the day-to-day -day interaction that sometimes the only, the only joy you're going to have in life is the fact that the sun is out a little bit today and you got somebody to smile with, mm -hmm. right? You got somebody to laugh with. And you can go, and this is one of the other things I appreciate about Cecil, because we can in this work, it's very deep work, it's hard work, but we can go into that hard work, that depth, where you're really kind of in pain if you're being honest with yourself. You're in pain doing the work because the work is important, but it's not always easy. And then you lift up to a joke, a laugh, and then you go back into the work, and then we kind of, you know, there's a flow to that, that what I find is that I like that flow because that is how I don't get clobbered and I don't die. Right? And I don't mean it in a dramatic way, but I mean literally. We take all this crap in our bodies, mm -hmm. and then we start to learn, look at, we look across the room like, who in your family lives past what age? Mm -hmm. Right? And I got in my family that bifurcation. Some folks live kind of a long time, and some folks don't. Mm -hmm. And how we manage the things in our lives in that in-between space determines a lot about that. 
right? And so when I think about health and I think about my own, you know, mine and ours collectively, right? Mental health, physical health, all, how all those things go, on, go about and how we actually get work done and accomplish things. It's just really inspiring, right? It's really inspiring to think about what I've learned from Cecil and because of what I've learned from Cecil, what I can give to somebody else. I'm not Cecil, I'm not a Cecil. I wish I had you know, a few more sprinkles of that, <laughs> that magic. But what I learned from Cecil too is, you know what, I got my own magic, right? And I sprinkle my own magic, it's my own blend, but I'm inspired and I'm, I've learned. And I continue to learn and I hope that I'm able to, to spread that and share that. And so lastly, one of the things is, uh, well, two things. I tell all my students, you all have something I never got, right? At the very least, you have something I never got. The ways in which I've had black male teachers in my life are teachers that are generally, they are my family. Those are the black men that have taught me the most. My dad, my grandfathers, my uncles, right? These are the people that have taught me a lot. But I also have learned from all of my teachers, regardless of their background. And so I try to take something that I've learned from each one of them and incorporate that into what I give, what I put forward. And so I'm really inspired every time when Cecil says stuff like, what would you do if you knew you could not fail? Say right? again. What would, <laughs> what would you, you do, do if you, you knew you, you could, could not, not fail? fail? Right? And so I've said that to students before, and then I'm inside, I'm like, oh, shit, here I go. Look at this. I'm, I'm you know. <laughs> for that reason, though, I, for that reason and much more, and I know I've talked too long, but I have a tremendous amount of love and respect for you, Cecil, for the work that you've done with all of us, for your humanity, just for the person that you are, uh, I'm so glad that we have this. I'm really looking forward to seeing those big scissors come out so you get to cut that thing. Uh, and thank you for all that you do and for all that you've given to all of us. I want to direct my comments. Did the party yeah, she did that. I want to really direct my comments to Cecil. So, as is typical, I last saw you 6.30 in the damn morning. That was my fault because I told some people in Florida that we would be meeting at 9.30. And I was thinking Pacific time, but I typed Eastern time. So Cecil was right on time, looking wide awake. I believe I took the meeting in bed on my laptop, but, but I did put a cashmere sweater over my nightgown because I'm classy like that. But this is typical of Cecil getting me into some stuff making me know I needed to do that thing, mentoring a young black scholar, talking about cultural taxation. And as is typical of Cecil, he was also right there with me, as is typical. And so I'm going to tell you from the heart how much I love you is immeasurable. And you and I, we're always going to know each other because that's just how it goes. When you call, I'm going to answer. I may not answer if I'm eating dinner. I may not answer if I'm playing with Zora. I may not answer if I've been neglecting my husband, and that's the minute that I'm spending with him. But you know I'm going to get back with you because that's the relationship that we have. But the other thing I want to say to you is I know the struggle you waged on all our behalf. And that's what this is really about. Because we can tell funny story, like I could talk about how Mo and this one here, Audrina, would conspire. Sharon, if you see him going for the mic, do not let him walk to the back of the room. He will never, we'll never get him back. We, ne we will not end on time. The clock is ticking. You know he's going to take us to church with that. Where would we be? What would you do? What have you done? So we have all those humorous stories, and, and they're, they're great. But what I want to just say is I saw your struggle, and you made clear to some of us your struggle. And I know the pain and the strife and the strain of taking this union out of white supremacy because we were marinating in white supremacy. And that's why I held my nose when I joined the union, just like I typically hold my nose when I vote. Mm -hmm. But you, you were the bridge. And this is one of those cases, the, you know, the book, The Bridge Called My Back, 
the bridge was his back. The bridge was this man's soul. The bridge is this man's heart. And what you have given us is something that will go on and on and on and on without end. And so I'm not going to talk long because I'm emotional. (laughs) But I just want to say I know what you did. I know that you did this alone. Look at us all here together. Now, just imagine being here alone with those people. Some of them are pictured on the wall (laughs) upstairs, that wall of whiteness. Broke it down a bit. I think Charles' picture should be really huge. (laughs) But you were the bridge that I walked across. You were the bridge Charles walked. You were the bridge that brought Tyrone here. You were the bridge that raised Audrina up. Because these people didn't raise any of us up. You did that. And I saw it. And sometimes you told it to us. So I want to say I'm so happy that you are able. Where's your beautiful wife? Lynn. I, I want us all to also thank Lynn. Because she helped to hold you up through those times. And where's your brother? Oh, the double trouble. I want to thank your family for holding you up because I know how important your family is to you and that the time you gave to us is time you took from them. But I just want you to know I see you. I love you. And you can still always call me and say, Sharon, I have something I need for you to do. And I'm going to do it because I have so much trust in you. But I also will tell you I am an angry black woman. And I will never forget what they did to you, and I hope they pay. That's how I roll. Thank you for giving me this time to come, and um, I want to say, if there was anything like you being the father to your kids, Charles, Elise, Audrina, I am your grandchild. (laughs) It is because of them that I was able to come to CFA and be welcome here. So thank you for raising great kids so that they can raise a great grandchild for you. Thank you. He saw me and he came up to me and he made me feel like I belonged. And Cecil told me, it's going to (laughs) change. It's going to change. And I didn't know what he meant at first, but then I kind of knew what he meant. He meant that it's white and it's about to become black. And I knew what he meant. And I just felt so powerful and empowered because Cecil was the kind of person that you know when he says something, you know it's real, right? Mm -hmm. He's not one to just pontificate. He's not the person that just says something to say something, right? You listen when Cecil speaks because he speaks with authority. He's a commanding presence. His voice is authoritative. He's just a good-hearted, loving person. I love him with all my heart. But I'm going to tell you all something that nobody don't know. Cecil's probably the only person outside of Mo Miller that's been to my house. And he was at Fullerton doing an event. And Cecil was like, I need a ride to the airport. I said, I'll take you to the airport, Cecil. No, brother, you ain't got to do it. I said, Cecil, I got you. But before we go to the airport, why don't we go by my house? Let's have, let's have a Heineken. And let, let, me, let me beat you in ping pong. Now, y'all may not know, but he sicked his wife on me, right? Because I beat him so bad in ping pong. Yeah, I'm telling the truth. <laughs> he sicked his wife on me. Yeah, come on, Chris. I got somebody that could beat you. But we had a couple of brewskis. We played ping pong, and we bonded in Irvine after leaving Fullerton. But I'm going to tell y'all what y'all don't know. If y- y'all think this world is white, Irvine is pretty white. Yeah. And Orange County is pretty white. And I just felt like I had a shield of protection around me because Cecil was with me. Now, you know, <laughs> two black men in Orange County, he's like, oh, we're about to have a Black Panther Party meeting in here. <laughs> I just love Cecil. You just, Cecil, I got crazy mad love for you. You just make me feel so just blessed just to have you in my presence, to have mentored me the way you have. Um, that's a good brother right there. I got your back. Wherever you need me to be, that's where I'm going to be, Cecil, because you have made me a better person. 
because of you. Thank you, brother. I love you. I'm really sure what I want to say because Cecil, as Margarita and many others have said, it really is about you taking an interest in us as a human being. Uh, when you first came to San Diego State, I had no issues with CFA. CFA just didn't really exist. I was a member, <laughs> like Margarita. I, as soon as I was hired, I became a member. But everything I saw at the chapter level was all white. And you said to me, well, you need to do something about that. <laughs> and it wasn't until I came to a statewide meeting and the, the Council for Affirmative Action and the, um, then the African American Caucus that I saw that CFA was not the way it was represented on my campus, that there was a possibility for it to be something else. Uh, did, I didn't know that I was going to continue to work with CFA. I just knew that there was a space. Yeah, you knew. <laughs> because what you have done to all of us is you have mentored us. You have showed us that we can do it. You have shown us that it really is not about individuals. It's about changing structures. Uh, it's about changing the organization. And I know... When we've hired a lot of new folks in CFA, we have new members that are becoming part of the organization, and they are coming into an organization, wow, it's ARSJ, it's doing all this great work, but we had to, and I, don't, I was going to use a, a metaphor of a dog, we had to fight like dogs, but we had to fight like hell to really change this organization. It was painful. It was grueling. It still is. <laughs> uh, but we have created a space where more voices, more people can actually contribute to what a higher education labor union has to be today. It can no longer be the way it was. And I recall when I nominated you for a National NEA Award, that it became an opportunity for the nation yeah. to really see the kind of leadership you are already giving to CFA. And because of the seed you planted, that so many of us here and those who are not here who will look at the video, we are trying to carry that work forward and we are making an impact nationally Every national labor union, certainly education labor union, they're following our lead. <laughs> we are the one that are paving the pathway. And again, we do the labor stuff. We got to bargain a good contract. We got to pay our people well. But we know that working conditions are much more than just a salary. They're about a semester off for parental leave, right? <laughs> They're about cultural taxation, aren't they? Yeah. So, Cecil, you are my brother. We talk, we tell each other, we love each other. And in one of your darkest moments, when your oldest brother was passing, I'm on the airport and you call me and let me know that he is transitioning at that moment. You are my brother. You are my mentor, and I have had six brothers. I have one left. Uh, but you are the brother that really has, lead, uh, or has led me uh, to the particular path that I am on now, one where I just cannot tolerate at any level white supremacy culture. It has done too much damage to too many people. We cannot have that operating in our union and in our CSU, and that's because of you, my brother. <laughs> and I know before I shut up, Sharon's already said it, but you suffered as you tried to move this organization forward. I recall so many examples of how no one paid you any attention. They ignored you, and you did not let that stop you. You found other ways to get around and you brought all of us in to this work. And as Margarita said, we're continuing to bring 
others into this work so that the organization will never go back. And I said that when we moved to an ARSJ uh, transformation. Once the organization commits to it, it can't go back. <laughs> I mean, it can go back and say, well, we're going to be a racist organization, so it's not going to do that. But it still requires that we bring new people into this work that we are finding out every day in the work that we do that there's something else we haven't thought of. There's a new direction we need to take this. Uh, and that's what uh, really being inclusive is. That's what really being a union that represents all of its members, all of the students, and that's what we owe to you. And again, I wish we could do the whole building <laughs> and dedicate it to you. Who knows, in the future, maybe we'll have some other opportunity to even spread uh, your name further because your name must live on. You have really transformed uh, higher education uh, labor union work. Thank you, and I love you. I didn't know what you were going to say. You know, we talk about this labor stuff. Mm -hmm. He got it honestly. Our mother mm -hmm. was the, the organizer of the garment work mm -hmm. um, She went to a high school called Needles and Trade which transformed into um, Fashion Institute in New York City. So, see, has got it honestly. Okay. Um, when we were at Stony Brook, Cecil and, what, five other people? <laughs> there were six of us. <laughs> set up, started the uh, Black University, Black Students United. And he set it up pretty much like he was trying to work here, or he was yes. working here. He had, and, and this is the way we have to do it. The upperclassmen were the ministers, the lower class, class people were chairmen. We made it such that the upper class and mentors the lower class. And so when the upper class and graduated, mm -hmm. the chairman went to minister. <laughs> and the new person went to chairman. And that's, I, you know, when I heard that today, I was like, he hadn't changed. <laughs> <laughs> this is nothing new. <laughs> you know, our family, we're family fighters. We like to fight for justice. Oh. We like to fight for equality. I think for season I, it's because we're Sagittarian. Sagittarian just love people being honest. Mm -hmm. We don't like things of being unfair. Yes. And but we know that this place is unfair. That's right. Okay? So we're just gonna keep fighting our whole lives. But that's okay. Mm -hmm. Because we won't rest until it happens. Okay? I don't have a lot to say. I'm proud of my brother. I'm, I'm proud of hell. Okay, I wish my older brother were here. Yeah, yeah I okay? do. Yeah. And let me tell you something. It was always the three of us. My mother said, the only things I can leave you are each other. Mm -hmm. Okay? And so we've done that. We honored her. My grandmother, um, my nana was 106 and a half when she passed away. Wow. And I used to say to her, nana, how are you? And she'd say, just trying to make life last. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are today, just trying to make life last. All right. Okay. You know, what can I say? Uh, this is such an honor. Uh, and I feel so honored by you all. And for each and every person who came here and took the time out, um, I, I so much appreciate that. I did write some, some things down. <laughs> because I didn't want to get up here and start stuttering. <laughs> um, and you all know, I, have, I always have something to say. Now my phone's not going to start working, right? Where's my pen stuff? Come on. Yeah. There it is. I'll put, keep it this way. I want to thank God first for all that he has done in all of our lives. Because without him or her, uh, we can do nothing. We can do nothing. Anything we have, we have because of God. I want to thank CFA in general, the board, the staff, everybody, 
for, for this honor and this recognition. I want to thank my family and my friends who took the time to come and, 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 and thought uh, this was worth their time. Uh, I want to thank you all for that. I, I want to thank staff, CFA staff, and, 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 and all the officers, um, because again, they, could, they do important work and they could have been doing something else. I, I, I'll tell you that I was shocked when I was told that this was going to happen uh, because Calvin talked about our mother. My mother gave, didn't get any particular recognition. She just worked. She just knew that work had to be done and she did it. And that's how she raised us. Don't, you know, you know she said, uh, you know, I, I worked with a guy who told me one time, he said, you know, he said, uh, um, praise is like perfume. Smells good, don't drink it. <laughs> I want to thank all my colleagues, those who are able to come, those who sent me um, regrets and said that they couldn't come. Um, you are all very important to me, and I thank you all. Our journey toward a more perfect union has had its shares of twists and turns. It's had its, turn, its, its share of highs and lows. We could have bailed on the struggle. We could have given up the journey. We could have settled for being just another service union. But we didn't. But we didn't because we knew that there was something else out there. And the folks you see in here today and folks who you may not see in here today who understood that CFA could be so much more than it was, so much more, could do so much more for people, for, for not just the, the, our colleagues who are professors and librarians and all the titles that, that we have, but also for our students. Knew we could do so much more for the staff that works in, in, mm -hmm. in, in, in the CSU. They have all looked to us to see what justice is all about, what equity is all about. And we can proudly tell them, yeah, we know what that's about. We have struggled for that. We lifted our gaze and focused our will on democracy and justice. To be a more perfect union is to be a democratic and inclusive union. To be a democratic and inclusive union is to be an equitable and just union. Building a, democ a democratic union was and is not easy. There has to be an adoption of a unifying vision a vision so powerful and clear that it accommodates the many self-interests and then melds them into an actionable common interest. We start with self-interest. I started with self-interest. I looked in that room in 2002 and said, no, this cannot be what represents me. <laughs> okay? And I stood there with three women. There was one, one black person in there, by the way, Mugu. Mugu was in that room. I didn't know him, but he was in that room. But so was Audrina, so was Jackie Teepin, so was Rena Doyle. I stood with those women and I said, is this it? <laughs> this is it? And they said, this is it. And I looked at all of them and I said, we're going to change this. This has got to change. This cannot be what represents us. So it wasn't easy. But that was the easy part. We found that, uh, like our nation, maintaining a democratic and just union is the really hard part. Okay, because there are forces out there that don't like what we're doing. Okay, they would like to, if they could, they would kill us all. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not being dramatic. Okay, they would kill us all. 
Okay? Yeah, they work hard at that. And we got to work hard at, at, at staying alive and being together and being a, a force that works against that white supremacy. So the journey's begun, um, but there's more work to be done. Justice is everybody's right and everybody's fight. I'm going to repeat that. Justice is everybody's right and everybody's fight. We can never forget that because that's, that's what animated it for me. As I looked at this union and, and sat in those meetings and, and was bullied sometimes, I'm not going to be bullied much. <laughs> okay. uh, or, or ridiculed sometimes, I'm not going to be ridiculed much. Okay. Um, it's hard to be in a meeting where you're the only one yes. saying some things and everybody's looking at, looking at you like, you know, mm -hmm. why don't you go away? Yep. Why don't you go away? We don't want to hear this. Y'all know that. You know what it feels like. Yes. Yes. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said this, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. You think about that. You think about how we are all tied together. Okay? If we could get the politicians to understand that, it would be a wonderful thing. If we could get the government to understand that, it would be a wonderful thing. This is a multicultural nation. We all have a stake in this. Okay? But I'm going to just say this. Black folks have been the ones who have pushed for democracy. We have been the ones saying, because we know what it's like not to have it. We know what it's like not to have the justice. Okay? So we push and we say to the world, look, this is what it could be. Why don't you want it to be like that? Well, we know that there's some economic issues why it's not going to be like that. Okay? Because they want us to be workers. They want us to be the folks. They still want us to be the slaves. Still out there just kind of plowing and not getting educated. But we, we are educated. So when, when we finally understood Dr. Dr. King's idea, when we finally got it, when we finally got that notion and that principle, we realized that our purpose was bigger than just working on behalf of our members. Mm -hmm. yep. It was also working on behalf of our students and our staff and the staff that, of the CFU, CSU. It was all of this because we recognized that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. That's right. Okay? I'm going to put these away now. I'm just going to talk to you about what I got to say. Okay. We are the ones who we've been waiting for. That's right. Okay? We are the ones that are going to make the difference. And we can't wait for someone else to come in and do this. The work is ours to do. We have begun the journey, but the work has to get done. Audrina knows I was all, we always talked about the work, the work. What are you doing in support of the work? Because if that work doesn't get done, nothing changes. Nothing changes. So all of you are my heroes because you have the courage to do the work in the face of all things coming at you. Maybe it's not as hard as it was when I was the only one doing this, but it has the same impact on your body, the same trauma on your body. And even if you're sitting there with five other people who support you, that's still trauma. It is. We, are, we are CFA. I'm always going to be CFA. Uh, I tried to get away from CFA. It doesn't work. <laughs> it does not work. So I'm going to tell you all right now, when you retire, just don't even say, oh, I'm retired. That's, find something else you can do in between CFA. <laughs> OK. <laughs> My wife and I travel now in between CFA. <laughs> so I just want to say this. Um, I love you all. Uh, I, you know, it, it's not hard. You know, it's not hard to love you. OK? And if you love one another, you will do powerful, amazing things. I, I remember Mar Margarita asked me, she said, Cecil, what's the next thing? 
What do you think is the next thing? And I told her, you know what? That's for you to do. That's for you to do. When, when it was in my heart to do what I did, I did it. Now it's time for you to do it. And it may be a whole different direction. Maybe something you've never, ever considered. But it will be right for that time. Okay, we have to remember that we have to move on. That's one of the things that was the hardest for me, to remember to move on, to let others come forward because you, we get selfish in this work. All of a sudden, we think we're the end all and be all in this work, and we're not. Okay, I watch people. I watch people my age struggle with the young people. Oh yeah, because we want to be the leaders still. Okay, we want. You know, we know everything. Okay and realizing that they will find their path, but we have to leave them the marker. We have to, leave, we have to tell them what we struggled with, and that's the reason why A Journey Towards a More Perfect Human was written, to leave that marker, to leave something that people could say, okay, this is what they did. Now we move from here, rather than let's go back to the beginning, which is what, our, which is what organizations do all the time. So all I can say is this, you keep up the good work. Keep on doing what you do, CFA, because, and Charles, brother, I remember the first time we met in 2002, I think it was 2002, 2003, and Charles looked at me and he said, I said, Charles, we're going to change the union. He said, really? <laughs> and, now he's the pres and now he's the president of this union. Imagine that. Give him, a, give him a round of applause. He's the president of this union. Okay? And, and, and the officers, it's so different. It is so different. And the staff is so different. We have done mar marvelous things. And by the way, I sent, I sent a copy of the, of the notice to the past, present, and who will be the next president of NEA. Okay? Lily Eskelson. Um, um, Becky, Becky Pringle and Princess Moss. They all said, fantastic, <laughs> fantastic. So I worked with those ladies for a long time. We may not have the same relationship with NEA, um, but I still have a good relationship with them. And we should make sure we take advantage of that. Okay, because they, they, that's still a big organization. <laughs> and we have tried to change them like, we changed, like we're trying to change AAUP. Maybe Charles will be the next president of that. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> At any rate, um, let, 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 let me just say, you know, uh, one, day, one day I was giving a talk, and, and um, when I finished my, my remarks, I, I said to my wife, how did I do? She said, eh, you did okay. <laughs> did okay. I said, I said, why are you saying I did okay? She said, well, you know, you, you, you missed several wonderful opportunities to stop. So I'm going to stop now. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.